Chapter 20 Behind the Curtain Can I do something for you, or to you? Failure. I couldn't save Monterey Jack. I couldn't stop Steelhoofs from murdering Chief Grimstar. I was letting down my friends and everyone who needed me. The realization of what I had been doing to those closest to me with my damn addiction cut deep. And as much as I wanted to rage at Velvet Remedy, it was my fault that Monterey Jack was dead. I'd killed him with a mint. Actually, I'd killed him with a whole lot of them. I'd been eating them like... Damn it, they actually tasted like candy. How fucking wrong is that? I was physically exhausted and mentally overwhelmed, on the verge of crying. It took me a long time to pull myself up off the floor and make my way back. The basement was huge, cluttered, maze-like. I took a wrong turn and found myself in a room full of spark-powered generators, half of which were running, making the whole room seem to throb. A bank of them on the far wall were burned and blackened, their metal skins ruptured. One exploded generator was randomly sparking, making the air taste like lightning. The skeleton of a pony, severed in two by a hunk of metal shrapnel, rested forever on the floor a few yards from them. An engineering schematic on the wall told me that these had been the generators which powered the Ministry's magical defenses. They had given their lives, saving the building and its inhabitants from the Manhattan Balefire bomb. Well, all except for one very unlucky maintenance pony. I wondered what her or his name had been. Did the pony have a family? Did they know what happened? All moot, two hundred years later. Just one more tear. I backtracked and finally found my way to the exit. As I stepped out through the basement doorway, I was greeted by two of Ten Pony Tower's guard ponies. Little Pip, you need to come with us. I stared at them, then back to the door in the open basement. Was I being arrested? A weight sunk in my heart. They must think that I was responsible for the disappearance of Chief Grimstar. That was fast. But then, I had been running around like a mad pony earlier, and here I was, leaving the scene of the crime. Because today just couldn't get any worse. I nodded to the guards, saying nothing, and let them escort me to the constabulatory offices. I had been here before. I wondered if any of the ponies I had played seductress with in order to get a private audience with Monterey Jack would be there. They wouldn't need to execute me. I could simply die from embarrassment. One thing was for sure, I wasn't going to say anything. I knew what Steelhoofs had done, but what would be the use of pointing a hoof? I'd learned that lesson with Monterey Jack. Ponies turned to stare as they marched me through the Ten Pony Constabulatory. I could hear the half-whispers that followed my passing. I recognized a few of the guards on duty, including the one I had sweet-talked into giving me his pencil so I could write down all the ideas that my PTM-fueled brain had been devising. I drooped my head, wanting to crawl. I glanced up as we passed several guard ponies talking with steel hooves. From the look of things, he was here of his own volition. That did not bode well. In here, please, one of the escorts demanded. To my surprise, the door he swung open for me wasn't a cell, but to a nice-looking office paneled in fake wood and full of bookshelves. Take a seat, and don't wander off. Some pony will be here with you shortly. I looked to him with confusion. Sorry about the delays. We've had a situation with the chief. You're not on our first priority list today. I was so weary that I sank onto the little couch in the office and didn't move, waiting for what seemed like hours. I checked my pit buck. It was getting late. I was hungry and confused. There was a small radio on a desk corner. I turned it up, wanting to lose myself in DJ Pony's music. Instead, I was shocked to hear Steelhoof's deep voice rumble from the box. I'm no hero. If you're looking for a hero, look to Chief Grimstar. He bravely sacrificed himself to save all of you. I only wish that I could have saved him. Sheriff Rottingdale had been gathering a veritable army of zombie ponies in the maintenance tunnel surrounding Ten Pony Tower. There was a door in the basement through which the sheriff was going to unleash them upon the innocent residents of this tower. It would have been a slaughter. The talons hired by the chief learned of this threat, but were not pleased with how things went down. When I encountered the talons, there were considerably fewer of them than when Chief Grimstar hired them. 
So they neglected to inform the chief of any of this, leaving all of your lives in jeopardy. When I informed the chief, he insisted we go down to investigate the Talon's story. We found the door and ventured through with the intention of making sure it could not be opened from the outside. We were destroying the terminal that controlled the door access from the maintenance tunnels when the zombie ponies attacked us en masse. Only my armor saved me. I still remember Grimstar's final words, ordering me to flee, close the door, and make sure it was disabled from inside the tower as well. He stayed back, fighting to the bitter end, sacrificing himself to give me the time I needed to make sure Ten Pony Tower was and is safe. I stared at the radio. By Celestia's mane, he was actually going to pull this off, wasn't he? DJ Pony's voice was now on the radio. From an interview an hour ago with one of my faithful assistants, the Ten Pony Constabulary has confirmed the Steel Ranger's tale based on a computer entry left by Chief Grimstar. Oh, wait, was that why he trotted me into here? My lock-hooking skills seemed virtually unique, but I doubted that my ability to hack a terminal was nearly so rare. And, if any pony could do it, who was more likely than a knight of the Ministry of Technology? It was just a guess, a suspicion, but it struck me that Steelhose was covering his bases. Part of me almost admired what he was capable of. Part of me was angry that he was using Homage's broadcast, dedicated to the truth of the wasteland, no matter how bad it hurt, to spread his lies. I turned off the radio. Some pony finally arrived to speak with me. The debonair gentle stallion who took his place on the other side of the desk was a mottled brown unicorn with glasses perched on his nose and a scroll for a cutie mark. Sorry to keep you waiting. Let's get down to business, shall we? I nodded glumly. I was no longer curious why I was here. I just wanted to get whatever it was over with so I could go on. The unicorn levitated several scrolls onto the desk and opened them. Now, you should be aware that there are expenses that have to be accounted for. The cost of the rope used to hang the Antari Jack was 35 bottle caps. Fine stuff, premium made. The cost of the executioner was 25 bottle caps. Then there are cremation expenses. The stallion looked over his glasses at me. Unless, of course, he would rather they just throw his body out into the street for the birds. His tone suggested that that would be looked upon as uncivilized, but that he was required to give the option. Cremation itself is 100 bottle caps, plus an additional 57 for the basic box. I stared with dawning comprehension. I was going to have to pay for Monterey Jack's execution. I was dumbfounded. How in Equestria did that make sense? But I thought, as I sank into depression, it did make sense. It was my fault that he was dead. Why shouldn't I have to pay for it? I listened dispiritedly as the list of fees and expenses and legal charges grew and grew. One year's rent for both the cheese shop and his private quarters, amounting to 7,200 bottle caps. Altogether, required expenses and fees amount to a total of 9,047 bottle caps. I stared vacantly for a moment. Then I nodded. With a sigh, I asked, How long do I have to pay for this? I don't have that kind of money. As a group... We had easily more than double that, but I couldn't feel right about draining such a huge amount of bottle caps from what was Calamity and Velvet Remedy's money as well. Steel hoofs too, although I felt less of a pang about that. The General Stallion just blinked at me. Perfect. By their standards, I was poor. I mean, I could probably pay for about half of it now. Giving me an odd look, the Stallion informed me. It's already been taken out of the accounts. Unfortunately, Monterey Jack didn't have sufficient funds to pay for all of it in caps, so a fair amount of his personal property was confiscated for auction in accordance to... He droned off legalese that went completely over my mane. Confusion scrambled my thoughts. So, I didn't have to pay for Monterey Jack's execution? Then why pull me in here to tell me all this? Did they just assume that I wanted to know, so I could gloat? Was I legally required to gloat? The General Stallion was staring at me again. A frown broke across his face. Well, I just lost that bet, he muttered to himself. Then addressing me. You have no idea why you're in here, do you? I shook my head. Monterey Jack was convicted of attempted burglary. You were the pony he tried to rob. Therefore, upon death, all of his properties are legally yours. What? Wait, wait, wait. What? It was bad enough that I thought I was being punished. 
I had to make peace with that because I deserved no less for my stupidity and failure. Now I was being rewarded for it? No. The world did not get to be that fucked up. I refused to let it. The stallion considered me. Honestly, there are a number of ponies who suspected that Monterey Jack's confession might have been more from the magic of your horn than the weight of his conscience. He informed me. I remembered the whispering as I passed by. Of course they did. Any pony who knew about the twisted bit of legalese would suspect me. Even I hadn't been able to comprehend why Monterey Jack had confessed until I talked with him privately. The legal stallion continued. I personally had laid good caps that this was some sort of plot cooked up between you and Monterey Jack. Again, he frowned. Clearly not. I stared at that. What? He died. What kind of plan would that have been? The stallion shrugged. We all know Monterey Jack hadn't been right since his wife died. After Clarinet was killed, I'm all they have left. Clarinet, right? I asked, and the legal stallion nodded. He mentioned his wife. What happened to her? There's a rumor that there is an untouched stable out there in Fetlock. A few months back, they were trying to find it. Never did. Nobody has. My heart sank. It was absurd to feel guilty for having found Stable 29 myself, wasn't it? She was killed by a manticore. According to Monterey Jack, he killed the thing, but not before it stung them both and torn her up right bad. Poor fellow only had enough anti-venom for one, and she insisted he use it himself. With her wounds, according to Monterey Jack, she probably wouldn't have made it out even if he had given it to her. The stallion shook his head. Of course, that's just how Monterey stole it, but I've never known the stallion to lie before. Sweet, merciful Celestia. The legal stallion cleared his throat and turned back to the documents in front of him. Returning to the matter at our hooves, even after fees and deductions, you are still left with private quarters, the deed, and the business license of the shop and a modest amount of home furnishings. Of course, there are two matters which I must attend to. This was so wrong. I couldn't be gaining property from Monterey's tragedy. I just... I couldn't accept this. I didn't deserve this. First, of course, is the simple fact that you are not a citizen of the Tempony Tower, and as such, you are not permitted to operate a business within the Tower. Normally, it takes several years to earn citizenship, but, with the legal standing of these properties, if you started applications now, you could possibly achieve citizenship in, mm, little more than a year. He looked over his glasses, fixing me with a stare. Still, it is in this office's recommendation that you sell off the deed and the business rights to the shop to some mayor or gentle colt who is a citizen. Make yourself a tidy sum and be done with it. I nodded. I wondered if homage had any use for an ex-cheese shop. Second is the matter of Monterey Jack's children. My ears shot up. What was this? Who are legally allowed to remain in the private quarters until the end of the month? So while you do legally own the property, I'm afraid you won't be able to kick them out of it until... I felt like I'd been hit by a piano. By the twisted legal fuckery of Ten Pony Tower, I was the one bucking Monterey Jack's filly and colts into the deadly wasteland. I felt I was finally seeing behind the curtain. Monterey Jack's execution made me the heroine that his children worshipped, into the ponies stealing their home from them just after their father died. The ultimate buck when they're down. Unless, of course, I did something about it. Exactly like I had already done. I'd taken care of them before this trap had snapped shut. I looked up at the stallion as a new feeling burned away my depression. Anger. He played me! I screamed at the walls of my suite telekinetically overturning all of the beds. My eyes were burning with tears. My heart pounded with rage. He set me up. I made all the blankets tornado about the room. I was the goody four-shoes filly he knew he could manipulate. And he was right. I stomped on all hooves. The blankets soared at the window and rebounded off the glass. I hated Monterey Jack. I wanted him dead. But he was already dead and I wasn't some pony who could change her mind and take my frustrations out on his children. He was so right about me. So instead, I took my fury out on my room, and was thankful that none of my companions were around to see me do it. It was too much. The shame of my addiction, the pain of how I'd hurt my friends, the betrayal of Velvet Remedy's actions, and now, Monterey Jack's forehoved fucking of me from beyond the grave. 
I hurled one of my saddlebags against the wall. If levitation could have had any real force behind it, I probably would have punched a hole in the room. As it was, the saddlebag just clanked against the wall, opening and spilling its contents. A lifetime's worth of party-time intels rained down onto the floor. The stash from Pinkie Pie's safe. I stared at the pile of tins, frozen in place. It took only a moment to transfer all of my rage and sorrow onto the drugs. Before I knew it, I was in the bathroom, dumping tin after tin into the toilet water, cursing them and myself for everything we had done to my life together. Flush. There went a month's worth. Flush. There went dozens more. I was throwing away countless bottle caps worth of them. And good riddance. They would never have the chance to hurt any pony else. Flush. There went what I allowed myself to become dependent on. Flush. What I had let become between me and the ponies who were closer to me than any family had ever been. I was crying so hard I could barely see what I was doing. But I didn't need to. Flush, flush, flush. The last tin of party time mint house floated in front of me, hovering over the toilet. Open. I just had to tilt it and flush. Easiest thing in the world. Telekinetic child's play. A tilt and a flush. The tin hovered there, not tilting. The last tin. For all the damage they had done, that I had let them do, Party Time Intels had saved my life and the lives of my friends, more than just once. Should I just keep one tin, just in case? But if I took even one more, I could become addicted again. It only took one the first time. And I couldn't do that to myself. I wasn't Monterey Jack. I wasn't willing to screw me over like that. The tin started to tip. But what if that mental clarity was the only thing which could save my friends? What if it was Calamity's life on the line? Or Velvet Remedies? Or Steel Hoofs? Wouldn't they be worth the sacrifice of myself? Yes. Yes, they would. The tin leveled and began floating back towards me. But... Could I do that to them? Put them through it all again? And wouldn't it be a betrayal to even keep one tin? The tin stopped, floating above the lip of the toilet. Little Pip? Amage's voice startled me from the bathroom doorway. My magic imploded, dropping the tin into the toilet, metal case and all. I looked at her, startled, eyes red and puffy knowing I looked like a completely ugly mess. Amrit stepped into the bathroom, looking peaceful and elegant in her dress. I cringed back, not wanting to accidentally touch it with my filthy body. She didn't let me get away. She grabbed me, pulling me against her breast. I couldn't contain myself anymore, and broke into open weeping. I heard the metal tin as Amrit levitated it out of the water and dropped it into the pile with all the empty others. Flush. At some point, Amage nudged me from my suite up to the Athenium where she lived. She played soft music and stayed close to me, leaving DJ Pony's broadcast on a newsless loop of songs. How long before this makes the news cycle? I asked wearily as the sun was beginning to set. Amage gave me a gentle but reproachful look. Toast to repair Pony Kick's addiction. More at the top of the hour. The pretty gray unicorn gave me a nudge with her nose. Really? I don't think that's something for the airwaves, do you? I smiled gratefully at her. Let me cook you something to eat, Almond said before she dared leave my side. I realized how badly I was starving. I hadn't eaten for the better part of two days. Almond put to shame the restaurants of Ten Pony Tower with their woven fried banana puree and whatnot. Simple, delicious cooking. And she didn't mind cooking more when I finished off everything and was still hungry. After dinner, I was feeling tired and emotionally drained, not to mention very full, but I now had enough energy to help her clean up. Where did you learn to cook like that? I asked, wishing we had someone with even half of her skill traveling with us. I was sorely tempted to suggest she join us, and not just for her food, but I knew she was needed here. All of the equestrian wasteland depended on DJ Pony. My delinquent youth, she hinted with a wink. 
I pressed her with a hoof, and she elaborated. I really was an assistant to the last DJ Pony. That's how I took up the matter when he fell ill. I was the only one who knew him. The magic voice spell has been passed down for at least five DJ Ponies, so the Wasteland never knows there's been a change. I nodded, having suspected as much. I spent several years after getting my cutie mark running around the Manhattan ruins and beyond with Joke Blue, a close friend. The friend, I realized, that she had mentioned before. The area between here and Philadelphia wasn't nearly as deadly as it is now. I hunted for recordings and memory orbs to give to DJ Pony, in the hopes that they would somehow have new music or useful news for the broadcasts. Did other errands for DJ Pony. Earned my way into the tower. Learned how to survive along the way. Cooking, weapon maintenance, and a lot of practice hacking computers to get into locked doors and safes. I thought of all the hacking and lockpicking I had done, driven largely by curiosity and a need to explore and to know. Even if what I learned didn't mean anything. Like, keeping the memory was an acknowledgement of, and a tribute to the past. Joke Blue, she was the one who knew her way around the weapons and had the skill to disarm traps, on which trailed off as a clearly painful memory hit her. Do you... want to talk about it? Ahmed smiled, a tear in her eye. <sighs> Most traps. Some cruel bastard rigged up a baby carriage with explosives. Used the corpse of a newborn colt and recorded of a baby's crying to lure the victims in. I cringed, horrified. By the time she was close enough to realize the baby was dead, it was too late to run. She tried to disarm it, but... The dear unicorn's voice broke off, choked. Now, it was my turn to hold homage. I stretched out on homage's bed as she gave me a massage. Either she had learned a lot from our visit to the spa, or she'd had practice. Either way, it was wonderful. If I was a cat, I would have been purring. I felt her press against me as she leaned close to whisper in my ear. I know you're under doctor's orders to relax and not exert yourself. You listen about as well as most of his other patients. I nodded, not really wanting to talk about that. Or really about anything. What she was doing with her hooves was divine. She was pressing them in circles against the back of my legs and at the base of my rump. Not as skilled as the professional spa ponies, maybe. But unspeakably more delightful because it was homage doing it. So, I won't apologize for helping you break them further. I had no idea what she was... Oh, hello! I gasped as I felt her tongue someplace I'd only imagined it before. Pleasure burst through my whole body. And she was just getting started. This was definitely going to qualify as strenuous activity. I sat up, startled, my gaze drawn to the dark window. Beside me, Amage stirred in the bed, opening an eye as she magically shifted the covers. Uh, little Pip? She questioned sleepily. I told her I thought I'd seen a flash of green outside the window. It reminded me of the flash I'd noticed in the fog nearly a week ago. Probably just a balefire, Phoenix. Homage dismissed, nuzzling close. There are several of them in Manhattan. Yeah, I nodded. But I think this one's been following us. We spent the next morning together. Homage left the bed long enough to cook us a breakfast. And then a couple hours later to poke around at the emergency broadcast station above us. The news this time included a retelling of my brave and daring rescue of Blackwing's talons including congratulations from DJ Pony on once again stopping two eggs under one hoof. Apparently, I had taken out three alicorns single-hoofedly by blowing up a raider compound. I buried my head under the sheets. It shouldn't have been surprising to me. In fact, I would have been surprised if Calamity hadn't given her express permission to lay that on my hooves. Amit had proven she really did enjoy making me squirm. Every way she could. She was gone for the better part of an hour, leaving me to my thoughts. When she returned, I reluctantly decided to broach an uncomfortable topic. The Black Opal. That thing? she asked, immediately knowing what I was talking about. I expected her to ask why I wanted it, but instead... How did you know I had one of those? I bit my lip. Uh, an acquaintance wants me to procure it. I looked away, then back into her eyes. 
I was very tempted to tell the pony just fuck off, but I figured I would ask. Please feel free to say no. I don't want anything to come between us right now. Or really, ever. Ahmed regarded me for a painful moment, then smirked. Dear, the only thing come between us for the last several hours has been sweat. But even I have to attend to business, as much as I want to slack off. I'm not going to begrudge you doing the same. I breathed a sigh of relief. And, yes, you can have it. She caught my eyes with an earnest gaze. I have a gift for you too, but the black opal. Think of it as a down payment. I have a quest that I want to hire you for. My eyes widened in surprise. Anything? She laughed. You might not say that after I tell you what it is, but you and your friends, you're planning to head towards Philadelphia, aren't you? The laughter in her voice died as she spoke that name. I nodded firmly. I'm still convinced that something is escalating in the equestrian wasteland. Something involving Red Eye and the Alicorns. I know they've been around for quite a while, I told her. Long enough for Steelhoofs to become known to the monsters as the almighty Malicorn Hunter. Sarcastically, at the very least. Questioning my theory. The Alicorns have been around for a long time, right? But I'm guessing they've gotten a lot more common. Homage considered that. Um, hadn't even heard of them for about ten years ago. Now they're all over the place in Cantalot. And this last year I've noticed groups of them showing up in Manhattan too. I nodded again. When I uncover what's going on, DJ Pony will be the first one to know, I promised. And all Equestria will soon know afterwards, Amage swore. Although, I might get a four-leg up on you. I suspected the innuendo was intentional. If you complete this not-so-little task for me, you remember that bank of blank screens at the EBS? I had taken note of them when she first allowed me inside the MAS EBS and let me look around. I told her so. Those are the feeds from the Philadelphia Tower. Red Eye has taken control of that tower, or at least the 3% of the tower that I normally have access to and locked me out of it. If you're going that way, I want you to attach an override to the mainframe in the tower station. That should allow DJ Pony to finally have eyes in that horrible place. Red Eye has operated long enough in the shadows. I put a hoof down. Although stopping a pillow didn't have nearly the effect. Agreed. Amage pulled down the picture of Splendid Valley, revealing a wall safe with a door made of thickly armored glass. It opened for her magic with a click. There were three items inside, two of which she floated out, giving to me. The first was the black opal. I gazed at the item full of memories that Watcher wanted so badly. Oh, I want to give this to you as a gift, Amage said with a soft smile and a warm but insistent voice as she floated out a brightly pink statuette of a very familiar pony. I had never seen Pinkie Pie look so young and so alive. I half expected the statuette to jump up, animated by the sheer energy in her expression, and start bouncing about the room. This, I realized, was the real Pinkie Pie. Twilight's Pinkie Pie. In comparison, the mare I had seen in the memory seemed like a shadow. It was a gift given to me from the previous DJ Pony, who got it from the one before him. Oh, I'm told it was given to the original DJ Pony. Final scratch, by the manner of the Ministry of Morale herself. The figurine gave off such an aura of unbridled happiness that I couldn't imagine any pony's morale sagging about her. It served me well. And now... I want to give it to you. I looked at Amage, feeling a startled reluctance. I couldn't. This was an heirloom, it was. I know what you've been through. And I know what she went through it too. You... You beat it. She didn't. I want you to have this as a reminder. It's something to look at any time you feel the urge to bite down another mint owl. I swallowed hard. And, nodding solemnly, understanding the gravity of this gift, I reached out with my magic and wrapped up the little Pinkie Pie in a telekinetic sheath, immediately feeling a jolt. Everything became clearer. My body became more alive. It was more than a little like biting into a mint owl but it tasted like candy apples and cupcake frosting. What did? Part of my mind insisted. It wasn't like I had just put anything in my mouth. Between the Twilight statuette and Pinkie Pie, 
I felt almost like I was on Mintows without them. Only cleaner. Better. More... wholesome. I turned the statuette around to read the base. It didn't match the others. Of course it wouldn't match the others. Awareness. It was under E. I felt joyous and heartbroken at the same time. The statuette was a reminder, both of what I had done wrong and of the cost had I not been pulled from the abyss by my friends. A sorrowful acknowledgement of the damage I had done and now I needed to repair. And a messenger telling me that I had the strength to not do it again. And perhaps most of all, a keepsake from homage letting me know that she understood my weakness with acceptance and forgiveness. Thank you, Amage. This means more to me than you can know. I floated it into my saddlebag, which Amage had apparently floated up here with us while I was too emotionally out of it to notice. Opening the flap in the pouch where it held all three other statues, I took a piece of cloth and tied Pinkie Pie next to Twilight. Now, they could be together again. It was silly, but it just felt right. As Amage closed the safe, I took notice of the last item mounted inside the safe. It was some sort of magical energy pistol, but not of any make I had ever seen, and with a grip that wouldn't even fit in a pony's mouth. Curiosity sparked. I asked Amage about it. Long story, she told me. One night, Joke Blue and I were poking our hooves around Fetlock, trying to find a stable we'd heard about. When there was this strange explosion that lit up the clouds above, at first, we thought it was thunder, but then all sorts of debris started raining out of the sky. Chunks of the strangest sky wagon he ever laid eyes on. We took cover in a burned-out passenger wagon. When it was over, I found this thing amongst the rubble. Armage chuckled. Okay, maybe not that long of a story. What is it? Nastiest magical gun in the Equestrian Wasteland has ever seen, to my knowledge. One shot from that thing will turn whatever you hit into vapor. And not like the magical energy weapons you've seen, which do that only once in a blue moon. Every. Single. Time. Armage sounded... scared of the gun. I believe you could kill a dragon with one shot from that thing. And with those words, so did I. Where did it come from? I wondered aloud. The idea that there were ponies. The Pegasi, maybe, with weapons that devastating chilled me tail to four hooves. Joke Blue figured it was from some sort of flying tank that the Pegasi were experimenting with and it blew up on them. Me? I would have swallowed. I know I'm being a bit foolish, but I can't help but think it fell from a lot higher than that. Higher? I had the strange mental image of items falling to Equestria from the moon, emptying from Nightmare Moon's toy chest. Amage looked a bit embarrassed. You'll laugh. I promised I wouldn't and resolved not to, no matter how hard it was. The beautifully sexy gray unicorn took a moment to gather her thoughts, then starting cautiously. I once met a zebra. That wasn't what I expected her to say at all. My ears shot up. I leaned forward. They don't have the same relationship to the sky that we do. Obviously, since they have no pegasi. But it's more than that. Before the apocalypse... We ponies had always looked to the sky with a sense of joy and safety. We saw the sun, guided through the sky by Celestia during the day, and the moon, Luna's charge, keeping an eye on us during the night. Princess Celestia and Princess Luna were our benevolent rulers, and even though most ponies never met them personally, the sun and the moon were symbols of their kind presence everywhere, and to every pony in Equestria. I felt my body leaning closer, wanting to catch every word of this. I'd never heard Celestia and Luna spoken of this way. When they perished in the apocalypse, the Pegasi closed off the sky, sealing the sun and the moon from us. We turned them into deities to keep them alive with us. Even those trapped on the ground in the stable seemed to do so. A sort of parallel evolution, if you will. What she was trying to say was almost blasphemous, but I bucked away the desire to admonish her, leaning precariously closer to hear. I much had a perspective that I wanted to hear, even if I probably would not have listened to it from any pony else. She made me wonder, ask questions. For instance, would this explain why Clam did not believe in the goddesses? Was atheism a Pegasus trait? Unlike us, they had never lost the embrace of the sun and the moon. 
Uh, the zebras, though. They cringe from the sky, Amrit said. The statement was something I would have expected from a propaganda poster, not a pony who had learned this directly from a zebra. But I knew Amrit, and it would not be like her to speak objective truth as she knew it. Uh, the zebras look up and see the stars above shining down on us from great black emptiness. And the stars, they know, are not benevolent. I leaned forward, tipped over, and fell on my face. Amrit stopped, covering a chuckle with a hoof. When I'd gotten back up, probably looking as sheepish as I felt, she continued. There is an intelligence up there, the zebras believe, from the stars themselves. The stars burn with cold, malicious fire. No number of them could warm up the sky at night. They wish ill on our world. And sometimes, they will act. Not against us directly, but to enable us to harm ourselves, and ruin ourselves. I opened my muzzle. The suggestion that zebras were a bit batty dying on my lips. Yes, it sounded insane. But, didn't we have legends that suggested the same? I recalled the story of the mare on the moon. The real version, not that stallion on the moon nonsense. The stars will aid in her escape. In particular, they tell of four malevolent stars with hearts of cruelty and chaos which yearn to taste all pain and destruction, wrought by iron hooves. With a grimace, Amage added, If there's any truth to zebra mythology, I'd guess we've given them quite the banquet. Four stars helping destroy Equestria. Now why did that sound familiar? Amage shrugged off the eerie atmosphere that had settled in the room by her table. Anyway, like I said, foolish. Joke Blue was probably right. Some Pegasus experiment that blew up in their faces. Cautiously, homage at my side, I lowered my horn towards the black opal. If I was going to give this to Watcher, I wanted to know what was on it first. It was only reluctantly that I touched the opal with my magic and let it take homage and her Athenium away from me. I felt strangely wrong. We were in a darkened hallway, wide and elaborately decorated, walking towards a brightly lit room with a decorative curtain partition hiding half of it. There were four ponies walking in front of me, a fifth leading them. The mares of the ministries. The first pony I recognized was Pinkie Pie. While every other pony was walking sedatedly through the hall, she was bouncing like a fan filly on her way to her idol's next performance. The pony was a little younger than I had seen her before. The candy cane look was still going strong, though. I felt a pang of deep embarrassment as my gaze fell on the lead pony, the beautiful white unicorn I had fantasized about. And the pony I was riding just wouldn't stop staring. Celestia's solar flaring mare heat. The creature I was riding wasn't a pony. He, and he was most definitely unbearably a he, was as big as a stallion. I felt things that were not hooves at the end of my legs, and wings folded to my back, and a tail. Um, Spike? Fluttershy asked timidly, turning around and looking at me. Doesn't that hurt? My attention was drawn to something tight and metal squeezing my head. The recollector, I assumed. It did not seem designed for... whatever I was. I opened my mouth, which felt all wrong, and answered, Nah, barely feel a thing. Besides, Rarity wanted the memory of this. Well, she could have worn it herself. Twilight Sparkle muttered under her breath from directly in front of me. I saw my eyes go wide once again at the white unicorn with the perfect purple mane. She didn't seem to hear it, being engaged in conversation with the pony I knew to be Applejack. The orange pony with the three apple cutie mark looked a little younger and not quite as weary as she had at Pinkie Pie's last party. I sure hope this ain't nothing to do with that. Thing we never talked about. Applejack was saying, nervous with caution. Oh no, darling, I gave that project up ages ago. Rarity replied with graceful dictation. Oh. The orange pony sighed with clear relief. Good. As we approached, we walked across a fancy carpet woven with gemstones. I felt a cold shock as the creature I was riding stepped over it. Twilight Sparkle had stopped just ahead and turned to eye the carpet, as Rarity and Applejack talked. But her attention was drawn by Rarity loudly clearing her throat. Fluidly, Rarity shifted the subject, speaking up to address all four of the ponies she was leading. Now this is really just a first design but I think you'll all be impressed. 
Always thrilled to see one of your designs, Rarity, Twilight Sparkle encouraged. Rarity smiled with business-like thankfulness. And this is just the light suit, not the fully powered version. She turned to Applejack and smiled demurely. And I do want to make it clear that I'm not trying to step on your hoofs here. This armor isn't as strong as your Steel Ranger suits, and it doesn't quite offer the same protection. Then what's the point? Applejack interrupted. I don't see the use in creating armor that has any less protection. The group had reached the end of the hallway. There was a large mirror to one side of the room, and the other was filled with sewing machines, bolts of cloth, and dress ponies. Designs and schematics covered the walls. At Rarity's motion, they stopped, each turning their attention towards the partition. Except for my alien ride, who only had eyes for the white unicorn. Well, because there's more to an outfit than just how well it stops bullets, of course. Applejack looked ready to disagree strongly, but bit back a comment. Okay, Rainbow Dash, Rarity called out. They're ready for you. Around the curtain partition stepped the shadow out of a nightmare. A blue pegasus pony who was encased in a black insectoid carapace with only the front of her muscle and the other sides of her wings showing. Her tail was hidden within a scorpion-like sheath with a vicious barbed singer. The ebony suit of armor was sleek and wicked. Yellow-orange protective goggles with a bug-like compound eye pattern completed the look. Built into the sides of the suit were antenna-like protrusions, the crystals that tipped those magical energy weapons shimmering with shifting rainbow light. The reactions of the other ponies were immediate. Oh no! Whoa, Nelly. That looks... demonic. Ooh, Dashie, you look scary! The creature I was riding turned to watch Rarity suddenly take off. Fluttershy, come back. It's only Rainbow Dash. I. We? Turned back in time to see Rainbow Dash push up her goggles with an armored hoof. Her eyes narrowed, a smirk running across her muzzle as she lowered her body into a menacing battle stance in front of the mirror. She growled menacingly, the armor making her look positively sinister. Oh yeah, she said. This is cool. Reality reasserted itself leaving me feeling very strange. It was good to be back on my own hoofs. I didn't ever want to be that... thing... again. Steel Hooves approached me as I trotted across Tempony's monorail station. You're headed to meet that... Spritebot friend of yours, right? I nodded, eyeing the armor-concealed warrior. Watcher, he said, surprising me. You know Watcher? I blurted out. Then, mentally bucked myself in the head. I had to remember to start actually asking Steelhoof's questions. I know of Watcher, Steelhoof intoned. You don't live as long as we have without crossing each other's wake. It took me a moment to parse what he had said, but then I nodded. So, Watcher really has been around that long. Who is Watcher? And what is she, or he, or it, doing? Who? That I couldn't tell you. Steelhoof lifted a foreleg, looking to it. Watcher lets ponies know less about Watcher than I let them know about me. Not without good reason. He put his hoof down. As for what? Watcher has a habit of finding ponies with a... Who are... I wasn't aware that I was staring at him until Steelhoof returned the stare. Watcher finds ponies who are better ponies, and sets them on a path to find others, to create teams of friends. I found myself feeling nervous. I didn't like looking at my adventures from the outside like that. And then? Well, most of the time, they disappear. Or end up dead. That was not comforting. At all. Steelhoof stayed behind at the station as I trotted out alone onto the Celestia line. I didn't have far to go. The monorail curved around a ruined building, Tempony Tower disappearing from sight. And there was Watcher, the sprite bot floating silently. Waiting. I have it, I said flatly. Thank you, little Pip. I knew I could trust you. Now the sprite bot has a compartment for spare batteries. If you could just... No. The sprite bot floated silently for a moment. Huh? Watcher sounded perplexed. Trust goes two ways, right? I challenged. Well, yes. 
I relayed your message just like you asked, before you got the black opal. I nodded. Made sense, but not what I was after. Not now. I felt a fierce determination set in. Answer is still no. No? You got it, but you're not going to give it to me. Oh, I'm going to give it to you, I said forcibly. In person. Watcher fell silent again. This time, I didn't wait for a response. You talk a lot about virtues and friendship. Well, friends don't run away every time a conversation turns personal. You can't have friends if you hide behind robots and never let any pony see the real you. I snorted. Hell, even Steelhoofs does better than you do. You want this? I want to meet you. Why? Because I want to know if you're actually my friend, or if you're just playing me too. Watcher bobbed silently a moment longer. I wonder just how much the stranger behind the curtain wanted this black opal with the interesting but seemingly insignificant memory. Then, just as I was convinced that Watcher would tell me to go take a jump off the monorail, the toneless mechanical voice said, Fine. I blinked. It was the response I wanted, but... You're right, little Pip. I heard a beep from my foreleg. I've uploaded my location into your pit buck. I'll see you soon. There was a burst of static, and the sprite bot floated away on a drum solo. I lifted my leg to look at my pit buck. There was an icon on my equestrian map. Far, far away from Manhattan. In the middle of nowhere. It would take weeks to travel there on hoof. But if Watcher thought this would dissuade me, or even delay me, then Watcher was wrong. I had spent one more night in Ten Pony Tower with homage, after which, sadly, it was time to leave. Our first stop was Fetlock. Calamity spent several hours underneath the Sky Bandit installing the flex regulator and making sure everything was in working order. By the time he was done, it was getting rapidly dark. I've got great news, ponies, he said as he crawled out, looking greasy. We all got ourselves transportation. Velvet Remedy, Steelhoofs, and I stomped in thunderous applause. Now, this beauty is powered off an array of spark batteries, and the last two centuries ain't been kind. So we'll have to swap them out pretty regularly to keep her running. Wait, Velvet Remedy said with alarm. Do you mean this death trap's ability to stay afloat behind you could cut out at any moment? Calamity looked at her almost sympathetically. Nah, she'll start to sag first. Become hard to see you. We'll have plenty of warning. And, I assured Velvet Remedy, if that happens, I think my telekinesis is strong enough by now to keep us going long enough to land safely. There was no way I could live that much for a prolonged period. Not enough to travel anywhere, at least. But I was completely confident that I could keep us aloft, even if the spark batteries died and Calamity fell asleep. For a few minutes, maybe. The others began to gather inside the Sky Bandit. Already, Velvet Remedy was cleaning it with her magic and discussing how to decorate it. Neither of the boys seemed inclined to participate. I floated out a spoon and can of sweet potatoes, opening it. I was hungry again, and I had intended to eat lunch as I planned the next three moves. With the Sky Bandit, we could be on Watcher's doorstep in less than two days. Uh, little Pip, Calamity called out. You gonna hang out there in the rain? I paused, a spoon of sweet potatoes lifted halfway to my mouth. What? It's not. Boom. Thunder cracked directly overhead, and water came down as if some pony had turned on a giant faucet directly above me. I was soaked in an instant, my hair sagging all over my face. The can filled with water, floating chunks of sweet potato out onto the ground. Leave it to a Pegasus pony to know. Tossing aside the can, now mostly full of water, I galloped into the shelter of the passenger wagon. Calamity and Velvet Remedy took shelter behind steel hooves as I shook hard, flinging water everywhere. There was a beautiful piercing cry, and the balefire phoenix swooped out into the rain through a shattered window. It landed on the seat next to Velvet Remedy, whose eyes went wide. She let out a squeal of delight. You've named her Pyrelight, Steelhoof asked, echoing my own thoughts as Velvet Remedy fed the bird before curling up under her blanket. We've been traveling through the air for a day now, ever since the cloudburst had ended. The Balefire Phoenix had remained with us, or, more precisely, with Velvet Remedy. I, personally, found the name a little morbid. 
it made me wonder about my friend. We took turns sleeping and watching, passing around my binoculars. So far, nothing had shot at us. By now, we had a good idea where we were headed. It was hard to miss the giant mountain jutting up over Equestria like one of those spire towers. Once Steelhoes was certain Velvet Remedy was deep asleep, he stepped over me and whispered in my ear, You should persuade her to spend less time in that memory orb. I looked at Velvet Remedy. In the last sixteen hours, she disappeared into the Fluttershy memory twice. It was like she had an addiction of her own. That's not a good memory. Steelhoes rumbled, surprising me. I looked to him, wondering how a non-unicorn could know what the memory was. As if reading my thoughts, he answered musedly, I asked her. Oh. I felt like face huffing. What's wrong with that memory? Fluttershy wasn't like the others. Rainbow Dash wanted to win the war. Applejack just wanted to protect other ponies, especially after Big Macintosh died. Twilight Sparkle, she wanted to please the princesses, especially Celestia, Steelhoves intoned. But Fluttershy just wanted the war to end. That memory is the moment she put her whole ministry into the purpose of finding a way to end the conflict. And she did. I felt a shudder. In a world where not everyone is sane, it is the height of insanity to believe you could create a weapon so devastating, so horrible, that no one would dare use it. Oh. No. I looked at Velvet Remedy as she slept. The same urge that made me discard the memory warp from Horseshoe Tower returned, growing in order of magnitude. She loved Fluttershy, modeled herself after the sweet, shy, yellow Pegasus pony. She could never, ever learn this. Wait, I said slowly. You said no one. His odd word choice reminded me of my first conversation with Watcher. Steelhoves answered dreadfully. Perhaps the only thing more insane than believing such a weapon would bring peace is creating such a weapon. And then giving it to both sides. Steelhoves turned to me behind his helmeted visor. That memory. That is the beginning of the end of the world. Ultimately, Fluttershy killed us all. We were circling the mountain, pushing upwards. It was night, and Calamity was taking the ascent slow as I guided him with my pit box map. All right, he called back. I was afraid of this. Looks like your friend Watcher lives high enough in the clouds that we'll be above cloud level. We could be okay, but, well, tain't safe traveling above the clouds. At least nowhere where there's civilization above. Every pony was awake, as was Pyrolite. We all nodded, readying ourselves. I had no idea what to expect when we pushed through the cloud cover but I doubted it would be a cheerful welcoming party with smiles and muffins. Calamity flapped his wings, carrying us upward into the cloud curtain. It was like being plunged into a slightly damp fog. All I could see was the rust-colored pegasus pulling us through the sky was a hint of his orange tail. A moment later, the sky bandit burst up through the cloud curtain and the night sky expanded infinitely around us with evil stars. A beautiful full moon hung in the sky behind the mountain peak silhouetting up it like a vertical rip in the universe. Velvet Remedy let out an awe-filled, Ooh! Pyrolite gave a musical cry. The jaws of vertigo clamped down around me. My legs went weak, my knees giving out. Irrational panic told me that I would somehow be sucked out of one of the windows and fall endlessly up through space. Maybe one of the stars would get me. I clutched the side of the passenger wagon, looking down at the clouds. That was much better, and just as beautiful. The clouds were laced with silver from the moonlight, glowing with a gentle, calming light. My eyes, it was under E, spotted a glint of metal on one of the cliffs. I asked Calamity to pull us closer. I'd expected it was Watcher, or at least another Sprite Bot, but instead it was an audio recorder. I floated on to the Sky Bandit. This had better not be from Watcher, I said, starting to feel a touch pissed. I don't think so, Calamity said from the front of the wagon. I slipped the audio recorder away, looking out to spy what he saw. I kicked on my eyes forward sparkle. Just in time, too. 
According to my pit buck, I had found Dragon Cave. I think maybe your friend sent us up here to get eaten, Velvet Remedy said aloud, staring up at the huge dark opening. The Sky Bandit lay parked on the cliff behind us. Steelhose was helping Calamity out of the pulling harness. Eh, the pit buck date is 200 years old, I assured her nervously. So it was a dragon cave 200 years ago. Any pony could live in there now. Well, any pony with wings anyway. A freed Calamity trotted up to join us. Well, y'all plan on waiting outside till the sun comes up? Then, just in case we were, I don't recommend it. Velvet Remedy shook her head. Of course not. Little Pip, you go first. Oh, thanks a lot. I shot her a look. Well, the Watcher is your friend. That remained to be seen. I took a step forward. There was a heavy thud from inside. Something moved in the darkness, coming closer. Something big. Um, Ursa Majors don't grow wings, do they? Velvet Remedy asked nervously, making me want to buck her. Hard. I was frightened enough already. A dragon poked its head out of the cave. A huge, gigantic, fully adult dragon who could easily eat two ponies in one bite, even if one of them was steel hooves. Three if two of them were homage of myself. Hello, little pip. I'm Spike, the dragon said in a voice that was neither as terrifying nor booming as I expected. And don't worry, I'm not going to eat you. Footnote. Level up. New perk, Pathfinder. Travel time to remote locations in the equestrian wasteland is reduced by 25%. The drain on the Sky Bandit's spark batteries is likewise reduced. Quest perk added. Pony Sutra. You are experienced in the art of giving and receiving physical pleasure. You are more likely to have sexual encounters with specific characters.